So I see we've got everybody on mute. Um, I just want to let everyone know we did, the live stream did just come back up, start working again. So I know Chair Early called for a five, 10 minute break. I just want to make sure folks know uh, what you're seeing on Teams and yourself is, is back live on YouTube. And for members of the public, we apologize. We did drop our live stream there for a few minutes. Um, so apologize that you missed a few minutes of really good presentation. Uh, it'll probably be a few moments before we get it going. So I guess everybody stand by until the board is all back on and ready to go. Public and you're wondering why you're just staring at public and you're wondering why you're staring at public and you're wondering why you're staring at public and you're wondering why you're staring at public. And some very tragic to how that we can be back in the library. Very tragic to how that we can be back in the library. Very tragic to how that we can be back in the library. This is inherently uh, inherent buoyant life jacket. Uh, and uh, we raised that specifically because uh, we are 20 years really into the burn boon of inflatable life jackets. So obviously, there are a big proportion of the life jackets we see out there, and they have been. Um, adopted very heavily, especially by fishermen, uh, especially on coastal waters uh, and, and lower rivers. Uh, they're just very popular. Uh, we're at that stage with these devices where they're starting to wear out, trying to replace their mechanical devices, and that's become a focus of our education. We need to check these devices several times a year, blow them up, make sure they're all there, make sure the cartridges are good, make sure anything that's expired is uh, replace. Uh, as I was going through my boating here last summer, I, I realized the life jacket my wife had worn the previous year wouldn't hold air. I don't know how it had a nick in it and it would not hold air. So she accused me of, uh, of causing that to happen and I'm causing that to happen. So I'm uh, diving into the regulation section. Let me see if I have control. Okay. So we're going to review. It sounds like it might be dry. I will try to move through it reasonably quickly. But we wanted to review the current laws and rules just to put things out here and answer questions that there may be. Um, specifically, looking at ORS 830, and again, like all of our regulations in the state, we have those that are uh, in statute and that literally are the result of a law, of a House bill or a Senate bill. Um, and we have administrative rules and those are things that the Marine Board has the authority to put in place. Uh, the laws give the Marine Board authority to do things. 
including making rules in some cases, and we have to parse that out and try to uh, try to uh, understand the intent of legislators when they pass certain legislation, and that plays into this discussion. I'll explain how we met. So we're going to talk some about about personal flotation devices and rules. Uh, there's an interesting rule that gives police officers, peace officers, the authority to uh, suspend a voyage uh, if there's a certain hazardous condition. We'll talk about that. I wanted to look at penalties related to life jackets because that's changed uh, in the last year. Uh, and then uh, we do have some guidance statutes that uh, dictate uh, personal safety equipment also. The administrative rules, uh, in some cases, uh, statute and CFR code federal regulations. So we'll walk through that a little bit as well. We'll walk through that. Okay, so ORS 832.15 uh, requires, let me see, um, puts the requirement in that our orders must be consistent with the U.S. Coast Guard. We cannot deviate from those, although occasionally over history we have. Um, all boats must carry an appropriately sized life jacket uh, for each person on board. Uh, when in the in the boat and underway, uh, it tells us statute tells us that the Marine Board shall classify PFD types. Uh, historically, these have been the type one, two, threes, uh, fours, and fives. Uh, as we move away from that, you're seeing uh, references to throwable and wearable flotation devices. And it also uh, statute also includes mandatory wear requirements. So we'll talk about that. Okay, just a little more detail on here. So peace officer authority to require operator to, to remedy especially hazardous situations. What this means is uh, there are uh, three or four different <coughs> things that can occur that gives a marine officer or any peace officer the ability to suspend your voyage, tell you to go back to shore or you'll get a citation. One of those includes uh, improper or insuff insufficient personal flotation devices in violation of RS-232-15. So if, you, if there's four people out on your boat, and only three life jackets, the officer can cite you for that uh, problem, cite or warn you, and they can send you to shore. And if you choose to go to shore, that's another citation, and it gets uh, a little bit bigger. Um, this is something that is used more and more often these days. I have some numbers later. Uh, the penalties, uh, a person who uh, violates RS-832-15, commits a class B violation. So that changed in the past session, uh, and it is now, uh, I think, the $110 for an adult violation. It's still the class B for a youth, which is a $265 uh, citation. There are exemptions to the life jacket requirement that are in statute. Uh, this set of exemptions is different than the exemptions we have in rural. We'll talk about that. This exemption says, you know, if you're visiting from out of state or out of the country, uh, you are exempt from, from Oregon law. It's different. A boat that's owned and operated by, by the U.S. government uh, doesn't is exempt from these rules. Um, we can't uh, technically we can't apply statutes if they're inconsistent with federal law or regulations. Uh, and a boat belonging to a certain class of boats. Well, I think more important when you're in ship's lifeboat. Obviously, if the ship's sinking and you jump on the lifeboat, uh, you're going to be exempt from the carriage requirement from having a life jacket. Now, when we jump to administrative rule, uh, you see, uh, again, some duplication of statute. Life jackets on board, must be on board. You see the throwable flotation device um, detail. Um, 12 and younger, mandatory wear. This is sort of interesting. We'll circle back on this. Uh, the canoe and kayak exemption, so you don't need a throwable on, on canoes and kayaks. Uh, there is an exemption for racing shows. We should have some additional detail here. In your board packet, you should have um, a listing uh, of the actual rules and regulations. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but you can reference that if you'd like, and I can pull it up if we need to. Uh, racing shell exemption, so there is in rule, and it parrots Coast Guard regulation CFR, that if you're operating a, a racing skull or shell, uh, then you're exempt from carrying personal flotation devices or life jackets. There is a requirement in regulation that if you're operating a personal watercraft, you must wear, not just carry, but wear, 
a life jacket with inherent flotation. So that's uh, that's kind of a unique one too. There is an exemption in rule for sailboards and float tubes. That is also something that shows up in CFR. And another thing that is uh, that we've got is the requirement for class three white water to wear your life jacket in class three white water. And that's something that is actually said in statute with some additional detail in the ministry of rule. When we jump to the code of federal regulations, uh, you see uh, what was the genesis for a lot of the state regulations. You see the personal flotation device and the required language. The exemptions uh, are some of those are there. You see the stowage uh, requirements. Uh, that's where uh, a life jacket must be readily accessible. You see the language that it must be in serviceable condition. So if it rips or tears or heavy fading, uh, it's not considered in serviceable condition and it's that's not a legal life jacket. Uh, and then you see an interesting uh, uh, CFR that was added in 2004 that sets the requirement for children to wear personal flotation devices. Uh, what's interesting about this is at the time, back in, in, the, in the 1990s, uh, the National Transportation Safety Board made a recommendation and encouraged NASPLA and various other agencies to adopt uh, child life jacket requirements. The state of Oregon adopted that regulation in the rule in 95. The Coast Guard didn't get around to it until 2004, so technically we were in violation of Coast Guard requirements because we uh, exceeded their preemption authority. Um, but we got we got past that for the most part. Now in Oregon, we do have some mandatory wear requirements. The mandatory wear is one of the big questions kind of, of our day. We'll get to that when we start talking about education. But in 1995, Oregon drew rule, and you have a uh, the rulemaking um, document that went to the Secretary of State in your board packet that was filed by Paul, uh, Director Paul Hafner in, I think it was 1997, when that final document was signed. And what it noted is that uh, in order for a life jacket to be readily accessible for children 12 and younger, it really needs to be worn. Therefore, the Oregon State Marine Board has adopted these regulations that require you 12 or younger to wear a life jacket. In 2005, um, there was, this one is sort of interesting because I do recall this as it occurred. In early October 2002, retired U of O Law School Dean Chapin Clark embarked on a guided trip on the Rogue River uh, he specialized in water law ethics and professional responsibility. He was very well known uh, in those circles. The boat that he was on, uh, it was a guided trip, entered the well-known coffee pot rapids about 55, 54 miles upstream from Gold Beach, went above the rock and spun, getting pinned on a bigger rock and dumping several of the occupants. Mr. Clark was well known to many in the law enforcement community. He perished in that incident, and his cause was brought forward by friends and colleagues. Uh, they visited with their local legislators uh, and carried a bill forward in 2005 that enacted the first whitewater life jacket requirements uh, in the state of Oregon. And what it said was, and, and uh, while it was an external bill, uh, they did talk to the Marine Board at the time about language looking for enforceability uh, and um, trying to make it as common sense as possible. And it says that on any section of water graded as class three or higher on a commonly accepted scale of river difficulty, require that all persons physically providing outfitting and guiding services and all passengers wear a properly secured United States Coast Guard approved personal flotation device of a type prescribed by rules adopted by the state marine board. Uh, so that became law, and we worked with the guide community uh, to implement that at that time. Uh, now go down the road another four years. Um, and we have another bill that was the result of an additional set of tragedies. So in 2006, we had six fatalities. Uh, we had a high, high fatality year, 20 voting fatalities that year. And I recall this. We had six fatalities, dramatic fatalities on the Deschutes River alone that were associated in or near Class Three uh, rapids. Um, I believe that a bill was introduced in 2007 uh, that didn't pass. It came back in 2009. Wasco County Sheriff Deputy Clay Piper, who worked on a number of those fatalities, uh, brought that forward as a personal cause, worked with Representative Huffman and Senator Ferrioli, uh, and implemented uh, the recreational voting version of that Senate Bill 579 for after guys. The feeling was 
it worked well for us and her guys. Let's port it over to, so to speak, uh, to recreational boating. Uh, so the language was virtually identical, and it required class or it required life jackets to be worn by individuals operating on any section of water rated class three or higher on a commonly accepted scale of river difficulty. So again, that was an act of the Oregon legislature, uh, and that passed in 2009. Uh, and has been something that uh, has been in place ever since. It's not heavily uh, enforced, um, but it is there in egregious uh, situations, and especially in Wasco County and, and some areas along the shoots, it does get enforced. We also believe that we lead by example. So it is a part of our contract with our county sheriff's officers that the county, uh, the county agrees that assigned personnel shall wear a Coast Guard approved personal flotation device while on board a boat. Uh, that includes um, that includes training uh, and the training that we must give them, and we do. It talks about life jacket use, deployment, and care. And he talked about some of that. That's why part of the reason we throw these guys in a pool when they're way down with their guns and duty belts uh, and make them deploy their life jacket. Um, there is uh, there's Nothing like an experience like that to uh, realize how important they are. Okay, this is a discussion item, and I want to approach you here, but we'll come back to it. Because uh, I know we have some board members who, uh, who, who this is their wheelhouse and would be interested in, in some of these thoughts. It is more complex than just the question because it's also something that comes out of federal language also. And that is the exemption for racing craft. So race, racing shells, rowing skulls, racing canoes, and racing kayaks are exempted from the requirements for carriage of any PFD. Racing shells, rowing skulls, racing canoes, and racing kayaks are manually propelled vessels that are recognized by national or international racing associations for use in competitive racing in, and in which all occupants row, skull, or paddle with the exception of the coxswain. If one is provided and or not designed to carry and do not carry the equipment and not slowly work better to race. So this turns out to be, um, I think in the day when this came up, uh, I don't know when this was implemented in federal law, I think it goes back decades. Uh, the primary access to this type of craft was through organizations, universities, colleges, uh, and organized clubs. What we see now is the growing use of these for personal fitness and recreation. Uh, and yet the exemption still applies. Uh, the, the question among law enforcement is if they are functionally operating recreationally and they are far away from land and there is no chase boat or safety boat involved, the exemption seems to fly in the face of our general life jacket requirements. Uh, and they feel they're frustrated because they feel like it is, you know, it, it, it is illegal. And we are in a place today with inflatable life jackets of different types where maybe um, maybe the concern about the bulkiness of the life jacket is a uh, there are no there are no specific exemptions for racing craft uh, in this. Uh, we have a difficult time uh, trying to I guess address this in any way. To, to be uh, I guess to be blunt about it, it's it's something that we have avoided trying to uh, further address until. Let's see here. Yeah, on this slide, we can see some of this uh, Code of Federal Regulations. Um, it's not actually as specific as state, um, but it, uh, it's in there also. Okay, so this one is going to take a little bit of a moment, and then we'll be done with the regulations piece. I wanted to look at what law enforcement has actually done on the ground in the last 10 years, according to the data that we've collected. Uh, so when I go into our law enforcement database and I download all of the voter contacts, uh, uh, violations, which include citations and uh, warnings, um, I wanted to look at those, how those uh, appeared for specifically for all life jacket stops. So you can see uh, third column from the right, all PFD stops. And when I first put these numbers down, I kind of wanted to cry. Uh, because back in 2011, we saw 952 uh, stops 
for personal flotation violations. So that's 950 points up that resulted in either a warning or a citation. And when you fast forward to 2020, we're at 529. So almost half, uh, a decline in almost half. And when I saw that, um, yeah, like I said, I kind of wanted to cry because that's not the kind of numbers I wanted to see. Then I decided to put it in some context of bigger numbers. So that's where I added things like uh, the second line over here. Um, you know, there's a difference between causation and correlation or uh, however that term goes. And there are just a lot of things going on. So for example, on the left here, we see uh, that funding is directly tied to patrol hours, okay? The more money you get, the more patrol hours you get. Um, over time, funding has been a little bit of a bumpy ride. In 2011, we uh, provided uh, $5,077,000 to our marine law enforcement partners. Now we're at $5.5 million to our law enforcement partners in 2020. Uh, you can see that it's gone up and down a little bit in the between times. Uh, how many boats are out there on the water to make contacts? Well, in 2011, there was 172,000. Now there's 160,000. Okay, that's one reason that uh, those number of contacts might have declined, is there's fewer voters to check. Patrol hours is directly tied to funding. Uh, I think I'm on the docket at the April board meeting, uh, and I would like to dive into these types of numbers in a work session with you also, so we can uh, kind of get down and dirty with all of the funding and enforcement related questions you guys might have. But, in a nutshell, 60,000 hour patrol hours, these are hours that law enforcement officers spent in boats on the water or on the shore doing patrol. This is not time they spent in their office writing reports or getting trained. So this is uh, where they have an opportunity to interface with voters. So 60,000 hours in 2011, about 45,000 hours in 2020. Uh, what I, what I what you're seeing here is an erosion in the value of the money that they're getting and the increased training requirements that pulls them off patrol uh, to maintain the various certifications. Policing continually gets complicated, we hear that a lot. Um, plus there's additional training because the turnover rates, there's a whole host of things that contribute to the decline in patrol hours. Um, when I look at the number of contacts, you see, well, that's kind of been up and around. Uh, 35,000 in 2011, it's been as high as 48,000 in 2016. Uh, it's back around 31,000 uh, this last year. And that's actually was a good jump from the previous year. Uh, so you can see where that bounces around. Oh, I see it again. Yes, Craig, ask the question. Yeah, I don't know if you want to ask questions by the presenter or the um, Go ahead. This particular part, chart. These are the PFP stops. This doesn't necessarily mean this is all the people who aren't wearing uh, life preservers. This is just the ones that were witnessed when they were stopped. That is correct. So these were stopped because somebody, um, they may have been stopped because their boat numbers were screwed up. And as the officer talked to them, he asked them about their life jackets and they were one short of, a, of the requirement. Or, they saw somebody on a PWC who didn't have a life jacket on when you're required to, or they saw a young child with a life jacket. Okay. So this doesn't necessarily represent who was wearing a life jacket. Correct. This is not a wear study. We'll get into that in a bit. Um, we'll talk about wear rates a little bit later, okay? Looking at your chart here, the last column, there's more wages terminated. 2020 and it wasn't 2011, although there was more uh, stops that showed people weren't wearing life preservers. So did we change uh, our policy on requiring people to be uh, returned to shore? Wow, so very astute, you're, you're jumping ahead of me here. Um, I, think, I think that we can debate that point a little bit. I'm not sure what that gets at, but I think it gets at what it could get at is that what we're seeing, and when I talk to officers, I see anecdotal evidence of this, is you're seeing um, fewer stops for life jacket violations because more people are compliant. 
So our education and our outreach has told people that they need to have life jackets on board for everybody. Most people know they need to have life jackets on their boat. Uh, you could make an assumption from these numbers that people understand that. Now that's different than people wearing a life jacket. You know, I can have four adults on my boat and nobody needs to wear a life jacket. When you get over here, the voyage is terminated. Uh, you're seeing a higher level, that's a pretty significant and steady increase in termination. So I think what you're seeing is more people are compliant, but law enforcement is more serious about terminating the voyage when people are not compliant, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, that, I'm trying to ascertain this chart, whether we've been doing something right and we're getting more people to work this chart does not tell us how many people wear PFDs. We will get to that. Wear rates are, that's the big question. How do you get people to wear life jackets? And Brian Paulson, who is up, uh, I think next, has some really good national data and statistics on that. Okay, so keep that thought in mind before we get there. All right, so great segue. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian Paulson, um, who I asked, to dive into some of the state and national data uh, related to this and see if he can set, shed some light on the trends uh, that we're seeing nationally. Brian, are you there and are you ready? I am, Randy. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Early, members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon about my jacket wear and wear rates and statistics. Um, Bear with me here, make sure my computer is working. So, common attitudes toward life jacket wear. So, before we dive into some numbers, I just wanted to go over uh, the general consensus on, on common attitudes. So, I went through about 20 uh, peer reviewed studies, uh, articles to gather a lot of this information, in which every source that I use is cited. Um, they're at the end, and I even have the link story. You can go review that the source as well afterwards if you want to pull additional data. So, first of all, um, boating safety educators believe that life jacket wear rates must increase to reduce drowning fatalities. Boaters often believe that they can don a life jacket in enough time to prevent a drowning. And to some, a life jacket can be perceived as a symbol of inexperience and weakness. And there is a perception that life jackets are uncomfortable and often interfere with the boater's activity. Also, life jacket use is less likely if the boater has a greater confidence in their swimming ability. Um, as Randy was just speaking, we see a lot more people having life jackets in their boat, but if they're not wearing them um, and not able to don a life jacket and not trying to prevent a drowning, that's where we start seeing these statistics shed light. So, Looking at national statistics in trends on life jackets, from 1999 to 2009, there were 7,782 recreational boating fatalities in the U.S. 71% of those resulted from a drowning, and of those 5,517 drownings, 87% of those were not wearing a life jacket. Um, that's, that's a big percentage. So, going back to that first slide, the main thing here is that boating safety educators believe that life jacket wear rates must increase to reduce strategy health. So, surveyed life jacket wear rates during 1999 to 2010 for nearly half a million voters in 30 states. Uh, the adult wear rate was 8.1%, and the youth wear rate was 59.8%. Now, that was specifically on boats. Now, one thing I learned when looking at all this different data is when PWC wear rates fall into the same category as boat wear rates, the data can be skewed. And that's because wear rates and PWCs um, is misleading, mainly because PWC white jacket has mandated wear loss. So that's one thing when we're looking for statistics, if PWCs or total water sources included that, that the wear rate can be skewed. Now looking at organs, observation of wear rates from 2008 to 2019, uh, power boat wear rates are significantly higher for 13 to 17 year olds and also 18 plus groups comparing Oregon and National, uh, specifically in the last three years. So the 18 to plus adult group 
15.2% wear rate compared to 5.6 nationally. Uh, on the 13 to 17 year old age bracket, 65.4% wear rate in Oregon compared to 35.7% nationally. Now that could be attributed to that Oregon has high risk waterways compared to several inland states. You know, when I talk about high risk waterways, coastal cold water. Um, it is worth noting that the adult power boat and power craft wear rates uh, are higher than national average for all 12 years of this, this data. And that the youth power boat wear rates were also higher, um, even though it wasn't much higher, but they were higher in all 12 years. Uh, looking at the Coast Guard's uh, report that came out for 2019 uh, from the U.S., there were 613 recreational boating deaths. Uh, the cause was drowning for 79% of these, 613 fatal boating accidents. 416 of those drownings were not wearing life jackets, so that's 86%. So as we start looking at these studies, you see that Generally, it's high 70s to 80% of drowning victims were not wearing a life jacket. Uh, it is also worth noting that 8 out of every 10 boaters who drowned in 2019 in the U.S. were on a vessel that was left less than 21 feet. 70% uh, of the fatalities occurred on boats that the operator had no known boater education. Um, I thought that that was worth noting because only 20% of the deaths occurred on boats where the operator had a voter education part. So looking at that statistic, it's definitely relevant that voter education, getting on a boat that's being operated with somebody with voter education is much more safer than somebody that's not. And on this statistic, it's over three times per year. Looking at the fatality rate compared to voter registration. So Oregon in 2019 had 165,253 voter registrations. That's 18 fatalities, so that the death rate is 10.9 deaths per 100,000 voter registration. If you look at it nationally, obviously you can see that Oregon is 10 deaths or greater per 100,000. Um, in fact, in 2018, we're right at that 10.1 mark as well. Uh, I ran the civil amount this morning for 2020, and we're at 16.9 deaths per 100,000 voter registration for 2020. Um, it is worth noting that this is a very important statistic, but some states, the scope of their registration doesn't include the same watercraft that Oregon does. So they may have more registered boats based on the fact that it's all watercraft versus all motor boats or sailboats or something like that. Um, the U.S. Coast Guard's observation trends, uh, children wear rates are higher if the adult occupant of a boat is wearing a life jacket. 65% wear rate versus 95% wear rate of children when the adult wore a life jacket. So adult role modeling is extremely beneficial, especially for adolescents in that 13 to 17 range. When an adult wore a life jacket from age 13 to 17, uh, the life jacket wear rate increased from 36% to 81%. That's a huge difference. And I think, uh, and Eddie can speak to this, run out with law enforcement and we do a stop, say, on a uh, Pleasure boat that's got eight uh, 15 to 20 year old uh, occupants, that age group, you know, a single wearing a life jacket. We, we make a stop that's got an adult wearing a life jacket, and, and those individuals in the age right are wearing a life jacket. It's actually something that I've seen quite a bit out in the field. Um, life jacket use also is noted to be higher among women compared to men. Um, looking at national drowning data, uh, from 2000 to 2013, uh, these two figures have great value. The figure to the left shows the proportion of fatalities that resulted from the drowning of the boat type. So if you look out of, say, 100 drownings on PWCs, or excuse me, 100 fatalities on PWCs as a percent, there is roughly a high 20% in the actual drownings. So you're more likely to die and a fatality on PWC for something other than a drowning. Um, I think that can be attributed to the fact that PWCs require life jackets. Mandated, uh, as you can see, the next one up would be a cabin motor boat, so a much larger boat is less likely to have occupants going in the water than, say, an open motor boat with new and a flip motor boat. Uh, 
Brian, you have a couple questions. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't see the screen. I apologize for that. A third. I guess it has a third bell. No. Okay, no. So my question is, uh, where does a an SUP fall into this? On on this slide, of moms. On on the national the, the drowning data, because I mean we've seen a huge increase in the use for subs. It has been playable. The wall that, problem is no, but not necessarily. Um, this this study in 2000 2013 now, I would anticipate does not have very good data on, on stand up how it works because they weren't as popular in that, that era. Yeah, um, Val, I have some statistics at the end of the presentation specific to Oregon for the last five years. Okay, uh, hopefully. And we'll thank get you. on that there. But you're right, there's a huge increase in use there. Okay, thank you. Craig, your turn. Brian, I'm trying to understand this chart. Now, the data is for all of the calories. So, Craig, so. If you look at the PWC, that's the percentage of all of the calories. Right. No, give me a second. So we're on the current slide. Sorry, I can't hear very well, uh, Craig. So on the, the bar graph to the left, so out of 100 PWC fatalities, and I'm just using that as a number for the percent, you are less likely to die from drowning in that fatality. So PWC fatalities, much less as drowning is a factor. There are no significantly higher percent of the fatality was going to be from drowning. And a lot of that correlates to the boat type. So really what this, this bar graph is showing is boat type. So as I go further on some of these statistics, boat type plays a factor in not only a regulatory mechanism in some of these studies, but also the likelihood that the occupants of that, that vessel or boat are going to go in the water. On the PWC, this being the only one that requires mandated I check where by state laws is where you see that that really small percentage of fatalities from drowning. Well, I find it surprising. You know, I had some people, friends that I've lost, but we were running PWCs. And that's about the only way you can have a fatality in PWC in my mind. But well, you don't have a lot of fires, you don't have a lot of collisions. So I'm looking. I don't know what part of the way you would die. Yeah, yeah, Craig, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, in Oregon, anyway, the bulk of our PWC fatalities are collisions. Uh, the ones that I can remember in recent years, uh, we had one on Foster where the individual was, was with alcohol or drug impaired and hit a stump and was killed outright. Uh, we had an individual here on the Willamette who was towing a, an air tuber behind his PWC and swung him into a uh, into a rock. Um, we have fatalities where PWCs uh, collide with each other or with other boats or with bridge banks. So the bulk of them really are collisions. Uh, we've even had an explosion or two over the years. Um, there have been, I, I know there was at least one instance where somebody was out without their life jackets at night, fell off and drowned. Uh, and that was that was a PWC attributed incident. So once you can see that the thing is that these statistics uh, demonstrate is if you require if, if for a for a activity where life jacket is required, you're eliminating drowning from most of the most of the deaths. Your other things will come in. Let's okay. put our hand down, Go ahead, Brent. Sorry, I can't see the hands either, just for verification due to the presentation. Okay. So, thank you for those questions. Uh, in regards to the pie graph, as you can see, it shows the percentage of drowning deaths by boat type. So, half the, the drowning deaths out there are, are actually the open motor boat. Uh, looking at promo promotional campaigns and observations, so we're a very uh, well known uh, life jacket wear campaign. Uh, there was uh, a study done in California, a six year study evaluating the effectiveness of increasing wear rates. There was the full intensity campaign, which included mass media and radio ads, events at marinas, celebrity endorsements, pledge cards, uh, even 
and tour about giving away free inflatable life jackets and education materials. Looking at this study, the three years before and the three years after, it showed minimal increases for wear rates, even with all this educational outreach. Adults, 8.5% to 12.1%. Youth was 15.9 to 21.2. And children were 80.8 to 87.5%. And those are the wear rates uh, over that study. Now, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had a pilot program for mandated life jacket wear. In Mississippi, they had mandated life jacket wear on four specific uh, lakes for three years. And this was a three-year life jacket rule that mandated all occupants on those less than 60 feet to wear a life jacket at all times. And then all occupants on those between 16 feet and 26 feet to wear a life jacket when underway. And boats greater than 26 foot are, or anchored 16 foot to 26 foot boats were excluded. The three-year pilot program included a four-year evaluation, the baseline and post-intervention years. Uh, it's worth noting that the adults increased wear rates from 13.8%, so that's pre-rule mandated, to 75.6% post on these lakes. The post-regulation pilot program, so the first year after the pilot program stopped, the adult wear rate dropped to 40.1%. So when it was not mandated, it dropped almost half the percent or half the, the overall wear rate. So 75.6 to 40.1. Um, both adult men and adult women show similar substantial increases. And one thing that's worth noting is the teenagers, that 13 to 17, increased from 47.8% to 88.2 to 87 and 91. Uh, going back to boat types, it's really interesting to see the difference in skiffs, the runabouts, the pontoons, uh, the wear rates. So skiffs, they increased from 27 to 83 to 79 to 81. Very consistent increase over those three-year period of mandated life jacket wear. Runabouts decreased from 4.3% to 71 to 66 to 68. And pontoons from 5.1 to 68 to 60. 59.2. So you can see, didn't matter what the boat type was, very consistent increases in life jacket wear rates based on those mandated radiations. Um, the fatalities were reduced by 75% in the lakes with mandated life jacket wear in contrast to the prior year's rule change. Uh, another study uh, that's, that's really well known uh, took place in Australia. So, yes, sir. Craig uh, has a question. Yes, Craig. So this this pilot program was completed in Mississippi. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had four specific lakes that they controlled, and they did this pilot program for years. So these statistics came out of the Journal of Public Health uh, on this specific study uh, that they partnered uh, with many different outreach programs to be able to bring this data. So it's not a national statistic. This it's specific to Mississippi. Correct. It's specific to so, Mississippi. So I don't know if it's just uh, Mississippi or maybe it's in Georgia. I know for this this study it was for those specific lakes. Okay. For these three years. Uh, but the, that mandate of life jacket wear is currently not in place. It was, this was a study to, to look at the wear rates and how mandated life jacket wear uh, would change that. Uh, so more stringent life jacket wear law study. Uh, Pre-December 2005 in Victoria, Australia, all recreational vessels were required to carry life jackets for every occupant on board. Uh, all children under 10 were required to wear them while underway. Uh, all persons being towed for water sports by vessel were required to wear a life jacket. And then PWCs were encouraged but not required. Post December 2005, all occupants of recreational vessels less than or equal to 15.7 feet were required to wear a specific life jacket while underway. Recreational vessels less than or equal to 15.7 included sailboats, PWCs, canoes, kayaks, rowboats, paddle and fun boats, kiteboards, and sailboards. So basically everything under 
15 foot 7 feet, whether it has an owner or not. All occupants of recreational vessels greater than 15.7 feet and less than or equal to 39.4 were required to wear specific life jackets at specific times defined as heightened risk, such as crossing the bar or night operations. Um, this heightened risk was defined as when a higher chance and sudden unexpected entry of a vessel occupants into the water. So one thing that you can look at is the boat type, 15.7 feet or less, higher chance of the unexpected entry of a vessel occupant in the water. Uh, when there is a sole occupant of the vessel, regardless of type or size, they must wear a life jacket. So these are the, the mandated wear laws that went into effect December 2005. Uh, this specific study looked at six years before. So there was 59 boating incident drownings during that time period and only 11 were wearing a life jacket. So that's 81% of the drowning victims were not wearing a life jacket in the study. Of the 11 that had on a life jacket, two were wearing incorrectly, two were wearing in inadequate life jackets for the water type, and 58 of the 59 drowning fatalities were male. Post intervention, so the five years after uh, the, the new laws went into effect, 16 recreational boating drownings, five to 16 water, wearing life jackets, so 69% of drowning victims were not wearing life jackets. So as you see, obviously a significant decrease in, in drownings, number-wise, but the ones that did drown were still a pretty high percentage for victims not wearing a life jacket. Uh, of the five, one was wearing a life jacket incorrectly, two were wearing inadequate life jackets for the water type. Uh, of the seven to nine fatalities that were not wearing a life jacket, Seven of those nine fatalities should have been under the new regulations, and it is worth noting that in seven of those fatalities, four of them had the life jackets on board the vessel on which they entered the water from. So they had the life jackets on board, did not have enough time to don the life jacket and travel. Post-regulation behavior changes in the study, there was a highly significant decrease in drownings. And that's across multiple factors, age, vessel characteristics, purpose of the boating trip. Wear rates on small vessels increased from 22% pre-regulation to 63% post-regulation. So big increase in wear rates. 46% of boat occupants wore life jackets more often. 77% were more cognitive of checking their life jacket condition. And 36% replaced their existing life jacket after inspecting. Now let's talk about comparable regulations. So the risk of drowning is not perceived high. The fatality rate is statistically identical to sea level use in automobiles based on exposure hours. And looking at history from 1968 to 1984, seatbelt use was voluntary with multiple campaigns encouraging the use. When seatbelt legislation passed, seatbelt wear rate increased appreciably. Motorcycle helmet use laws was a 1966 initiative to prevent deaths. Uh, some states have repealed the helmet use laws and shown increase in fatality rates. It is worth noting from 1984 to 2004, an additional 10,838 lives could have been saved had helmets been worn during the crashes. Really, that was a lot of numbers, a lot of statistics, a lot of research. Um, but really, the four points that I'd like you to take away from this is that there's evidence that supports life jacket wear rates have increased significantly with regulations mandating use. National wear rates among those not mandating use have had minimal change in 15 years, even with attractive outreaches such as wear rate and life jacket owner stations. Evidence and studies suggest regulations are likely the only way to increase wear rates and reduce drowning fatalities appreciably, and that statistically significant amount of voting incident drownings are not very much. And now I'd like to hand it over to Mary Ann McKenzie, unless there's any more questions. Yeah, Brian, this is Randy. I'm going to uh, jump in for just a second to the segue. So sorry, Mary Ann, let me interrupt you. Um, again, there were a lot of numbers there. And what we tend to see in the boating safety world when we go to our conferences, you know, when the National Water Safety Congress and the National uh, Safe Boating Council and others meet, they talk about campaigns. They're always looking for, you know, the best messaging, the latest silver bullet, the market trends, um, ways to communicate with new generations. They're always looking at ways to optimize uh, outreach campaigns. 
they uh, they use Coast Guard grants uh, to help understand uh, messaging and campaign trends. Um, often that are from research that is learned from National Transportation Safety, National Institute for Highway Safety, from NHTSA, and from others, because in the end, what we're really talking about here is uh, sort of public health campaigns. Um, and this is very similar to those types of campaigns. We even see these same types of things going on now with masking uh, education and requirements related to COVID-19 prevention. Uh, so there's, there's really nothing new under the sun. We learn from each other, we try different things, uh, and we're always trying to improve on the messaging the campaigns from the past. And then you see things, the parallels with helmets and, and seatbelt laws is once you go to the mandatory, to the requirements, then you see the big shifts in, in public use. You know, that's a huge policy decision to get to that point of requiring that, uh, but that's what has occurred in some of those instances. Um, so now I'm going to uh, hand it off to Marianne to talk specifically about the voting outreach and education, kind of the history and some of the things that are going on now. I see a hand up from Laura. Laura? Yeah, Randy, um, going back to your table, it was quite a while ago, it had the annual budget for law enforcement and the number of contracts and the number of voyages terminated and stuff like that. I had two questions. I had my hand up actually back then. And it okay. back into my question now. For the budget numbers, are those numbers, um, obviously the numbers were increasing pretty much, are those numbers equalized to a base year or is it just the gross number of dollars spent? That's just the actual dollars, that's not adjusted for inflation. Okay, cool. Of course you and then the next question is the number of stop, you've got a number for the number of registered votes in Oregon during those years. Does the number of stops and the number of interventions include unregistered slash non-motorized craft? It does, and that's one of the variables that you see out there. Uh, when you break that data down, you will see a trend in the early 2010s of contacting and documenting contact with non-motorized voters. So that's when, uh, I think in that, uh, chart you saw 2013-14 you saw a big explosion and or a big increase in the number of contacts. A lot of those is because they were documenting every paddle boat that they saw and we had to uh, uh, address that with a more formalized inspection process. Um, so some of those numbers are a little bit padded by things that were happening in the day, um, but overall uh, they're pretty, they, they give you a good trend of what was going on. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Go ahead, Marianne. Here early and members of the board, um, I'll be talking about our battalion rates and trends. And I just kind of wanted to follow up on Randy's um, information that he gave you regarding the national information about how we all work together and we can share ideas. Um, I do know that in 2014, uh, the Coast Guard did raise the idea of mandatory wear life jacket. Um, however, during that time, through surveys, it was found that 98% survey were not supportive of the mandatory wear. So that was, the idea was kind of dropped for a while. They came back in 2010, and they worked with the National Voting Safety Advisory Committee, which I'll be calling BSAC. It's an advisory council to the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard understood that this, again, was a controversial topic but felt they had maximized its current ability to reduce casualties. Um, they didn't expect any material reductions in casualties with the current measures in place. So they wanted to get the wear rate up to 70% and increase the skill level of training by millions and consider mandatory education and awareness campaigns. After lengthy discussions and research in April of 2011, BSAC wrote a resolution recommending to the U.S. Coast Guard to initiate efforts which target a future regulatory project to pursue requirements for life jacket wear for certain operators. And we can provide that resolution to you in the meeting minutes after this presentation. We do... Oh, do I have... Yeah, Laura, your hand is still up. Did you still have a question? I took it down when I finished. It doesn't show us up on my screen. It's down now. 
So this slide actually shows the Coast Guard wear rate data for the last 19 years, from 2001 to 2019. And as you can see, for the past uh, 10 years, the trend has not really changed, relying on several national campaigns and education. So why aren't we reaching these people to really tell them that we need, that they need to wear life jackets and that their behavior needs to change of wearing life jackets? The overall average over the 19 years, 83% uh, were not wearing life jackets during this time. The 2020 data is not out yet, which it should be probably in the next couple of months it will be out. For, uh, uh, Colleen has a question. Oh, go ahead, Colleen. Hi, I'm just curious, uh, on that part there, of the U.S. Coast Guard rates, do you know why the anomaly in 2009 had a dip? You know, we do not, and I don't know if it was because of, um, you know, weather or different um, elements that we're not aware of that during that yeah. time. Yeah. That so, was a great recession. What is that? That was the Great Recession. And one thing you see with voting is it does tend to follow recessions. Uh, it responds not necessarily in the way you expect, but my guess is uh, there was some significant reduced voting activity uh, in the summer of 2009 as we were coming out of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Randy. So then we show um, Oregon wear rates for drownings, and uh, you can see our trend line has fluctuated over the last um, uh, 19 years. Um, I did have 2020 in there, and when I um, over 20 years, the overall average was 67 um, percent. We had 2007 was the highest that we had rate was 89% of people not wearing life jackets and in 2005 was the lowest rate that we had people not wearing life jackets. Um, with all the fatalities over the 20 years, um, we had 294 fatalities which 69% were not wearing life jackets and if you break up to 20 years uh, from 2001 to 2010, there were 138 fatalities and 74% were not wearing a life jacket. And if you go to the 2011 and 2020, 156 fatalities and 65% were not wearing life jackets. So it was a little bit lower than the last uh, 10 years. So then if you look at our fatalities from last year, uh, we did have 27 total. Five of them were under the age of 20, um, and there were only two of them were actual operators. 22 were adults, 19 males and four females. We had 13 non-motorized. Of those non-motorized, there were nine males and four females. Five of those were wearing life jackets, um, but two, one was not fitted correctly, and three males, had, oh, sorry, not they were not wearing life jackets. Um, and then we had 13 motorized, oh, I'm sorry, no, five were wearing life jackets, two females, but one was not fitted correctly, and then three males and one was not fitted correctly. Um, we have, then we have a question. Oh. We, have a, we have a hand up from Craig. Yeah, you. Craig. Yeah, on the previous chart, uh, you seem to be showing that there were some drownings with people wearing life jackets. Yes. Yes. Um, they were either with, um, you know, uh, uh, medical conditions or blunt trauma or something to that effect. In, in Oregon, we have a high number of entrapments because of all of our whitewater activities. Uh, and in whitewater activities, life jackets are probably the least effective because of the highly aerated water and the number of the, the amount of debris in the water. Right. Thanks. Welcome. Um, from the 13 motorized, we had 12 males and two females. Um, two of them were from the one boat. It was unfortunately the, the husband and wife um, that passed away um, down in Florence area. 
And then only two were wearing a life jacket. There was one female and one male that were wearing life jackets. So there was a 17 total that were not wearing a life jacket. So what do we do with um, education and outreach? We have several programs that we uh, partner with, uh, national and other states. We love to share information and ideas regarding this. I am on the, the NASPLA Education and Outreach Committee. Nationally, I'm the vice chair. So I'm in a lot of these meetings throughout the states, and we definitely um, share ideas and talk about how our education programs are working to make sure that people are getting the information regarding life jackets and all other voting safety aspects of it. So our current outreach, we use our website, we use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, media releases. We also work with the Coast Guard Auxiliary when they do vessel safety exams. We also work with Boat America, which is also known as the U.S. Power Squadrons. They also do vessel safety exams and classes, too. Um, we also work with our Marine Patrol and, of course, our volunteers, too. We also do a lot of handouts. We have the orange awareness bracelets for adults and kids, which are really popular with the, coats, with the uh, Marine Patrol for handing them out to kids that are wearing life jackets and or at events. We do hand out whistles for those who are not wearing a whistle or don't have a whistle on like a lot of non-motorized boats that they need to carry. So then it gets them into compliance um, and we don't have to um, uh, take out their, you know, take them off the water. Um, we also do have kids activity books, the Let's Go Boating, that has a lot of different activities in there regarding life jackets, safety equipment, um, information about how to fit a life jacket, um, all different sorts of things too. We also hang out tattoos to kids, to kind of show that proper um, water behavior on and wearing a life jacket and some of them you can actually see a whistle on the, on the frog. So we all do, we basically want to show uh, good behavior of what you should be wearing on the water. Um, in 2017, we did our first set of stickers um, to hand out to people. These have been very popular with the adults. They love seeing their type of boating as stickers. And so they've been putting them on water bottles, on anything, you know, uh, their, their cars things like that, and this also shows um, good behavior of wearing a life jacket and a whistle on board your boat and doing the activities that you like to do. In 2019, we came out with the new set um, of showing, again, the correct uh, uh, activity and, and good behavior of it. Um, we kind of uh, had a lot of fun with this group, um, just to kind of tell you a little back secrets is that the middle one right here is actually um, our director's boat with him on board. This is Brian, who is fly fishing in his, um, in his drift boat. We just had a lot of fun with them. But it also shows, you know, a lot of people do love, this was a very popular sticker with the hunters, but it shows them wearing, you know, camouflage life jackets on, so at least they have a life jacket on. Um, and then we hope to have the next set of stickers out in the next uh, for this voting season and for next year. We have a lot of online youth education resources. We have um, our Let's Go Voting Activity book that they can download. We have worked with uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, and we have also used their uh, Bobber the Water Safety Dog on our website. So there are lots of activity um, pages that they can download uh, for them, for their kids, and they also have it in Spanish. The Army Corps of Engineers has a great foundation that they receive money from um, uh, for a, as a nonprofit. So they're able to do a lot of things that we are not able to do because of budget constraints. So we do, they do allow us to use their information for kids and in English and Spanish. So it's a great partnership for all of us. We also have our Waterwoods program, which is still ongoing. Um, well, at least not for this year because of COVID, 
but um, this is a great program for schools that it works with the curriculum and it's free for educators. We had some educators that were using it um, in their schools and they really enjoyed it. Um, but however, because of COVID, it's kind of stopped right now. But we do have a gentleman down in Curry County who it has been teaching a lot of great education to their schools in their local areas. And he's actually now been doing uh, water wits on uh, virtually with the kids and the teachers. And it's been working. Not as easily as it would if you're in a classroom, but it is still working and getting that message out to the kids. Um, in our boat Oregon, we do teach a lot of sections regarding life jackets, as you can see there. And we do actually talk about the risks, but it, for some reason, it it's not resonating with the voters of why they should be wearing a life jacket. So maybe we need to change our, our education into a different way of what NASBLA standards are. Um, we do talk about the risk, but maybe we need to talk about something else and in a different approach to the risk. Yeah. Do you also in the vote Oregon um, talk about the penalties involved with not wearing a life jacket? Not as much as we do, yeah. We, we don't really talk about the penalties because we want them to be have it more as a, a, a more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, positive, thank you. Positive reaction instead of a negative one with the, you know, with you must wear it or you're gonna get excited, this type of thing. Um, so we are trying to do more of a positive and reasons why you need to wear it because of the risks that are out there. We do talk about capsizing and falls overboard quite frequently um, in a lot of our uh, presentations. Lay, welcome. Uh, yeah, thanks, Marianne. Just since there was a little break in the action there, I was going to offer to the board, and it's always hazardous when I offer things and I haven't asked uh, Marianne or Randy at first, but if any of the board members ever want a package of those whistles to keep around and hand out to kids they see with life jackets, I do in my truck. And one, I always ask the parent first. And they all say yes, which I think they're crazy because then the kid blows the whistle. But it gives you a nice little interaction. It, you know, we all vote in different areas and interact with different people. And I think it's really just a nice little way to have a conversation with the family when you see their kids out wearing life jackets. So. I keep a little pack in my truck, and, and last year it was a little harder to give them out because I wanted to be sensitive to everybody's uh, um, social distancing, but uh, definitely started to give them out as we've had loosened up restrictions. So if that's something you're interested in, let, let us know, and we'll find a way to get you some of those. Val? Yeah, I just, uh, I took a picture of a kid when I was launching the other day because he he, he put his jacket on, and so his parent and his dad and his other friend did too, but I took a picture of him and posted it on social media. And, I, you know, he was just ecstatic. And That's so great. it'd be awesome to have a cap some whistles. So I'll, I'll email you. Yeah, um, yeah, right now we're in the process um, of ordering a new set. So we haven't, we ran out of whistles, but I do have a small stash in my office that I can send to you until we get a more, more of a supply. Hey, Marianne, I've just found a bag in my house, too. So we can do it. Oh, nice. <laughs> and then, Craig, you had something? Yeah, Mary, yeah, Mary and, uh, you said the program's not as successful as you would like. How do you measure your success? How do you know when you're successful? Or not? That's a hard thing to say. And then basically, I think it's most on... Um, law enforcement statistics and, and the citations that they give and the warnings that they give. Um, one question that I have, I have always asked and we do as a national education committee is how do we change the behavior? There's a lot of education out there regarding life jackets and the risks and everything, but like even as Randy said about COVID, you know, there are many things that are saying, you know, wear your mask, stay six feet, but people are not, still not doing it after thousands of lives have been lost. Um, and so it's, it kind of reminds me of how life jackets are. How do we change that behavior for voters to say, okay, yeah, it's just like a seatbelt. I just click it on and I'm safe. Um, 
but how to measure it. You know, we've measured about how many people have taken a mandatory education course. Um, you know, we're high percentage of that. But that doesn't mean just because they've gotten the education, they go out in the water and they follow it. Just like driving a car. You've got people that speed even though your speed limit is 65. You have people going 75 or 80. Um, we have been really in the national level really trying to figure out how we can change our messaging to make it more pertinent and, um, and more effective in our education programs. Uh, but do you know how many people are wearing life jackets versus uh, now compared to what they were before? So can you really tell if, if they're responding to your education program? Um, we do, based on the data of um, our incidents, I would have to go back and see how many were wearing life jackets um, versus not wearing them and see what our data is based on that, on the incidents. We just don't have that data right now, but I know, Randy, we had a, a, a survey done, correct? Yeah, I can weigh in on that a little bit. So what you're asking is the big question, is how do you improve wear rates uh, and how do you know why they've improved? Uh, the, uh, well, Brian referenced a national study done by the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, what's the name of that study, Marianne? The J, uh, I can't remember. They, they, uh, it became a, a huge priority for states to see that data on an annual basis instead of every four or five years because of just that reason. We wanted to see how many people were actually wearing them. So that is a statistically valid study. The U.S. Coast Guard sends observers uh, to all 50 states, 56 states and territories uh, to do observational studies. When you look at it on national scale, the data is very solid. When you boil it down to state by state, some of the samples are smaller and maybe a little less consistent. But when you see that, and as Brian noted, when you single out Oregon, our wear rates are actually about double the national uh, wear rates. Part of that is because we're a cold water state. And you see that similar trend line in all cold water states. Alaska loves to brag about their high life jacket wear rates. Well, they're also the coldest water out there, so it kind of makes sense. People have some level of common sense. Um, when we have done, so I'm going to do a little bit of historical analysis here. I've been here long enough. Back in 2000, or 1999, when I was hired at the Marine Board as a public information officer, I oversaw a $300,000 biennium campaign, biennial campaign for life jackets and BUII um, education. So imagine that, $300,000, $150,000 a year, about $75,000 for the life jacket campaign and $75,000 for the BUII campaign. With those campaigns, we used the marketing company in Portland, uh, the Guard Gerber, advertising. Um, they did a fair amount of pro bono work in that, so we got a good deal. They did billboards, television, radio, PSAs, uh, print media targeted at specific age groups. We had advertisements in, uh, inside toilet stalls. Uh, we did everything we could to try to appeal uh, to the particular audiences. And part of that study was to come back in the fall, in October and November, and to do a random telephone analysis of Oregon voters to see if see what their awareness of, was of the campaign and to see if there was any changes to their um, activities, uh, to their actual practices. Uh, it, was, it was cool to have that money. I learned a lot through that process. But after four years of doing it, and then Ashley uh, Master from PIO carried that on for several years, what we saw is we were actually teaching people, in some cases, the limitations of the law. For example, with BUII, a lot of people thought it was illegal to have alcohol in your boat. The campaign explained to them, because that is legal in Oregon, you can even drink and vote, you just can't be impaired in boat. What we actually saw in the data is we were teaching people that it was okay to have alcohol in your boat. They learned that through the campaign. That wasn't the desired outcome. Completely unanticipated outcome. 
Uh, and with life jackets, they learned that they needed to have life jackets in their boat. It was helpful to have them, but from a legal standpoint, you didn't have to wear them. Um, then we, we, we sort of morphed into the big life jacket giveaway of the mid-2000s. And Marianne and Ashley were both part of this. We partnered with the Lockheed Trade Shows, and we gave away 10,000 life jackets. And the lines were a mile long going into the um, Lockheed, uh, into the Portland Expo Center. It was crazy, and it was fun, and it was positive. And we gave away a ton of life jackets. Um, did we see a big dip in voting fatalities? Uh, no, but it was high profile. It certainly felt good. People saw the messaging and were appreciative of what the Marine Board was doing. Um, so it's like we're just continually holding this rock up. You know, we're pushing this rock uphill all the time, and it doesn't feel like we're ever going to get there. Uh, but if we quit pushing it, uh, then we're going to start going in the wrong direction. That's kind of how it feels like after all this time. So the answer to your question is, that's why there's a lot of frustration among voting professionals, is because we're doing these campaigns, but we basically, um, we hit the ceiling. Uh, we feel like we have, we're within a point or two of hitting the ceiling. The US Coast Guard has said, you know, we're at the 600 basic, uh, 600 annual fatality level after being at two to 3,000 a year, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, you can watch that curve go down as we've implemented all of these broad safety measures over time, including the education, improved carriage requirements, improved uh, engineering design, all those things. Now we've kind of bottomed out at about 600. And as Marianne uh, intimated a bit ago, if you want to see that number go lower, lower then you're going to have to look at the next step. And that's kind of what we're getting at. Um, so, so that's sort of a historical summary. After the Great Recession in 2009, we had to, and, and at that point, yeah, well, another thing is historical summary here. We had seen a 3% growth in voting through the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. And that was, as, our, as Director Don Humphrey used to put it, that inflation increase. That gave law enforcement a nice increase every year. We never had to raise fees. Uh, it was just always there. And then in 1999, Coincidentally, I hope the same year came to work for the Marine Board, that trend went the other way. And it, we talked out at 199,000 votes, and it's been down ever since. We're at about 160,000 now. Meanwhile, the number of paddle boats has increased you know, to a much higher level, uh, which creates uh, an additional amount of this safety work and messaging to a different crowd that's taken us a while to understand uh, and learn to discuss it. So that's some of the complexity um, that we're dealing with over the last 20 years. Um, registration numbers have declined. Um, use levels have increased. Certainly the market is more complex. It's changed dramatically since I was a public information officer. Um, and now uh, we're trying to get a hold, uh, get a hand on what's coming next. Uh, so I jumped in, Marianne. If you want to finish up and move along, then uh, go ahead. Yeah, and Craig, um, um, based on my previous um, statement of my, you know, it's it's not really working. Our, our program is working. Photo Oregon is working. Um, we are giving them a great educational piece of knowledge to become safer on the water. So, yes, it is working. But working for getting people to wear life jackets, I think we can do better um, for that reason. Um, we are conducting um, virtual classes right now due to COVID. We had a great um, uh, outcome for that. We had people from a couple of people from overseas that had taken the course that they were coming back to Oregon soon, and then they decided to take the course before they came back. So it's been reaching a different uh, level of people that has been really nice, and people are engaged in the virtual classes, and it's a lot of fun. So our next class begins in March again. And if you're more than welcome to sit in on them if you would like. Um, they are free, and uh, if you'd like to sit in on one of them, I highly suggest that you do. Um, life jacket kiosks. Um, with our grant, the Let's Go Voting uh, grant program that we've had, um, we've partnered with several um, organizations and agencies that we assisted in funding, uh, giving them the funding for uh, life jacket kiosks. These are the signs that we have used. 
Um, the Army Corps of Engineers helped us with the bottom one. They had an incident on Fern Ridge regarding a, a tragic um, drowning of a small child. And so this was in memory of her. And so they helped us with the Spanish translation. And so they erected it up in uh, the Fern Ridge area. But you can see all of the different life jacket kiosks in the area that they're in. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but and, and there are a lot more that we did not assist with, but we did give them the um, the drawings and um, for the kiosks to make sure that they can build them in, in well and, and the signs also. So I'm hoping this is going to work. This is one of our videos. This was created in 2015 in partnership with the NASCLA Education and Outreach Committee and uh, Calcomine, which is Vote Ed, one of our online vendors. Um, I was in charge of lead of this committee, and Vote Ed donated the film crew of this project. I had about five to ten members on this committee that we put together the, um, the dialogue and the script, uh, and then Vote Ed helped us with the video itself. This is his TV crew that they pay for. And then they were able to do all of this for us. So I'm hoping that this is going to work. Oh, Brian can't hear it. Because it's especially important when it comes to children. To start, make sure you have a life jacket that's the correct size for your child. Small, medium, large to start. And once you get the right size, you got to make sure that the life jacket is snug, not too snug. Once you put the life jacket on, you got to adjust the straps and such. A good way to tell if the life jacket is fitted properly is to lift up on the shoulder straps. The straps might ride up a little bit, but it shouldn't be more than an inch or so off the child's shoulders. If you're coming up more than that, or to the earlobes, then it's too loose to tighten up. So the reason to make sure the life jacket is snug is obvious. You don't want it to fly off your child if you fall into the water. But there's more to it than that. You don't want the life jacket to light up, potentially hindering your child's range of motion. And therefore, the loose should swim or stay above the water line. However, we don't want the life jacket to be too tight either. And the rule of thumb is to make sure the child can get breath without any problems. You should be able to stick your fingers down the back of the life jacket. If you can't, then it might be a sad time. Lastly, if your child's life jacket has a crotch strap, we we'll want to make sure it's properly adjusted as well. It shouldn't be tight against the groin area when your child is down, but it also shouldn't be so loose that there's much extra room in sitting. So you gotta find that fine balance between comfort and security. You may always make sure the strap doesn't allow the life jacket to come off over the child's head. Overall, the reason to ensure a proper fit is that safety is really important, especially when it comes to kids and preventing drowning. All right, remember the life jacket's got your back, but only if you wear it, right? Yes, So that video um, has been shared nationally. Uh, we also shared it with um, other organizations here in Oregon that I have found out that we're going to be um, doing uh, life jacket fitting for kids at some events. So I always sent them this video to kind of train their employees um, with those who are going to be um, fitting the kids to the life jackets to make sure that they're fitting them correctly also. This next video is um, was done by the Water Safety Foundation through a grant um, uh, from the Coast Guard. And WSF, um, the Water Safety Foundation, shares all of their videos with all of the states for free. Um, they use the grant money from Coast Guard, so that actually gives us the capability of using these uh, for free in any of our meet social media. We have posted all of these videos on our social media, and they're also on the website, too. So hopefully this one will play. Can you hear it? We can mute it. routine. A drive to the grocery, the barber, the hairdresser. Just a short ride, right? But 
Distractions occur. And even though you are doing all the right things, maybe somebody else is more distracted than you. The first thing you should have done, you actually did last. Amen. You may never need a seatbelt again. Consider a motor. Life jackets, like seatbelts, nearby are easy to put on, but not easy enough when something goes wrong. During a split second car accident, it's impossible to quit your seatbelt. How do you think you'll fare reaching for a life jacket during a voting mishap? <laughs> Just like seatbelts in cars, life jackets on boats save lives, but only when they're warm. Buckle up, voters. So those are two very good videos that we utilize and um, Army Corps of Engineers come out with some other videos and things like that. So we do have uh, many educational um, opportunities to share with our voters in our state. Um, for national campaigns, oops, it's not. Oh, sorry. My, Do you see that black box? I do. Go back to slide. Okay. Brian, do you see that black box? Yeah. Okay, there it is. I'm sorry. I had to get control of it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so we do a lot of work with the National State Voting Council campaign. We do um, independently within our state, and we also do nationally. Um, we have bought these life jacket zone uh, um, signs, and we put them up in locations uh, just to remind people around the launch ramps and things like that to wear it. Um, they have a how to choose their life jacket. They have several um, brochures, ads, and signage, info graphics. We use their Wear It logo a lot in our advertising and audio clips, um, and we use those that can relate to our voters. We also participate in their Wear Your Life Jacket uh, during Workday and then the National Safe Voting, uh, Safe Voting Week we also participate in. Okay. With the Army Corps of Engineers, we also use um, a lot of their campaigns also at the foundation. They do have a new one that came out a few years ago, Like Jeff, It's Warm, Nobody Mourns, and it's at the pleasewearit.com. They have several items that we can use, um, and also in Spanish. They have some of these that are in Spanish also. So we try to use those as much as we possibly can in our educational and outreach information. Um, so, if there's not any questions, I'll hand it back to Randy. Okay. Question. Okay. Feel like we're getting later in the day now, so I'll try to move through this. I don't want to leave it. So, moving forward, okay, we got all this great information, all these uh, great resources. I think I should back up. Uh, earlier statements, this is for Larry's benefit, earlier statements could be construed that I'm wishing Larry would give me another $300,000 for some big campaigns, and that is not the case. Not at all. Uh, we, we could always use more resources, but uh, I think we've got a really good talent here uh, within the agency. We've got some very motivated, passionate people, and we have a whole new world of social media and other uh, resources at our hands which have changed that landscape immensely. So uh, not, not going there. So just wanted to get that out there. Um, try to move forward to slide. Want to advance you on there, Brian? My mouse is not doing it. OK. Um, so to sort of start wrapping this up, I guess, generally members of the board, 
I, I definitely want to spend some time thanking you for taking time to listen to this information. Uh, this is a, it, it, I guess it's more detailed than, uh, than what it could have been. Um, but the information that's contained here has been the focus of multiple uh, organizations for decades. Life jackets and voting fatalities are one of the key things in ASBLA, uh, BSAC, Voting Safety Advisory Committee, National Safety, uh, or National uh, Safe Voting Council, and, and other organizations focused on for years. Um, we used this opportunity to have to to pour some internal discussions to look at what we've done in the past few years and what we can do differently um, in the coming years. Um, those are hard discussions because we don't feel like we're plenty busy, uh, but we can also spend more time and should spend time evaluating our program, looking for new ideas and partnering as broadly as we possibly can. So uh, one of the things that this caused me to do and really sit down and spend some time thinking about how we can do things better in the future. So this is the, uh, the going forward piece. Um, here, so these are some things that we have done either this last year um, or plan to do more of in the future. Uh, one thing that has changed for me personally is, access, is giving media access to incident, incident data. In our statute, there is very specific language that says um, Accident reports are uh, off limits to the public. Uh, they are confidential material. Um, I have been taught to take that very broadly. So anything that went into that accident folder, once we received it, um, was top secret and was not released to the public. Upon further consideration this last year or so uh, in talking to counsel, uh, we came to the conclusion that the language that's in statute really applies only to that accident report that is filed by the individual the accident. Uh, when we look at it that way, that really frees us up to have a better conversation with the media at the point when things are occurring. And an example of that is the recent double fatality of the uh, at the end of December. Um, that was a huge wake-up call uh, for a lot of us. Not, not a wake-up call. We know that SDPs and the leashes have, have been an issue for four or five years. We, we've lost multiple people because their leash became entangled uh, in um, you know, waterway obstruction of the trees and stuff. We lost one on the Checo a few years ago, um, the upper uh, McKinsey and places like that. Well, to have two, a mother or a father and a daughter on a birthday, they were doing everything right. They had life jackets. Um, they were experienced. They just had a leash on that wasn't right for that type of water. That's a huge education problem. So we used that. We used the data that we had. We had to use the information that law enforcement was giving us. And we appealed to the media to get the word out broadly as possible uh, and as quickly as possible. And we had a great response. Ashley did a great job working with media on that and getting that information out. And we had coverage on TV stations and newspapers across the state. Uh, and some really excellent, there's a, a clipping in your uh, board packet that really shows the level of detail that some media did. And I would like to make that uh, just a standardized process. I would like to put up a, a media resource page on our website that has more access to some of the raw data, the, the large collections of data, so media can get into that and make some of their own conclusions on this, because we certainly have nothing to hide, and the data speaks for itself. Um, Ashley's been working hard with Travel Oregon. Um, I can't remember the name of the, or, or what this, uh, what the initials stand for here, but basically she's drafted a letter a commitment uh, to participants in statewide um, tourism um, organizations. So when they're doing any water-related um, outreach, uh, you know, showing come to Bend, come bug in Bend, come ride your recipe, that they're always going to show people in life jackets who are following the laws and being responsible operators. So we'd like to get that letter commitment in place in the coming year uh, and then work with these partners. Social media is a huge tool out there. We're probably not utilizing it the best we can because it is a moving target and it takes um, a fair amount of effort to really understand it and have a good cohesive uh, plan there, but we're working on that. Um, Vote.oregon.gov has been a huge resource for 20 years um, and I think it's going to continue to be important. So I've asked my staff to sit down. Let's look at the life jacket page right now. So, you know, after the double fatality, uh, and we go on TV and say, boy, you know, make sure you got the right equipment. Make sure you know your waterway. 
check out the book, uh, the website at vote.org.gov and look up Life Jacket Safe. We want people to get to find that page easily and to get the most pertinent information. We have really good information on there, but there's a ton of it and it's easy to get lost in. So uh, we need to do some work on that. Um, next slide, please. There you go. Uh, video work. We've always done uh, video work, um, but we're trying some new things there. Uh, we're trying some subject matter expert videos. So as we've got, I've done a couple of these. They're great fun to do. Uh, they're informal. They're also very consistent with what you see across the web where somebody who knows what they're talking about talks about a particular subject uh, in a way that works on social media. Um, the Waterway Access Program, you'll hear more about this from Janine uh, tomorrow, I believe, uh, with the funding uh, through Viva, uh, we have some really great um, Spanish language uh, water safety videos that will be coming out in the, in the future. Uh, they look good. First one is out and it's, it's a wonderful product. Um, we are improving the access to the non-motorized course. We've had one course online that is free for folks, so if you're a paddler and you want to know the basics, uh, go on and take it. I actually sat down and took that course uh, and was a little disappointed it didn't go into leashes at all. Um, and there were a few other things that can be improved, so I think we'll have some dialogue with the providers. Again, that's a national course. Um, there is a paid course. You can pay, uh, yeah, I think it's $19, um, and take a course online and, and get a certificate from that too, and, and we're getting that posted. We have a new product called Mailer Light uh, that we're going to utilize. We've got 100,000, 100 and some odd thousand emails for registered voters and waterway access permit owners now, and we're not using it from a safety and marketing standpoint. So that's something that we can do in the future, uh, and we're talking now with business services on ways to, to do that, to kind of set up the protocols and that. Um, I've met, I've talked with uh, several individuals and other organizations and with Travel Oregon about doing a paddle safety um, seminar in April or uh, April or May, and that would be to bring the clubs together, the existing organizations, Oregon Whitewater and some of those, to spend a couple hours online on a video conference talking about how to get the voting safety, the, the basic safety message to rank and file voters out there. Um, that's something, leveraging those partnerships, uh, we do a decent job. Uh, I think we can Next. Okay, we can amplify our messaging to law enforcement. Uh, we give law enforcement a lot to do. We give them too much to do every year. So in the last couple of years, we, we've kind of backed off and said, let's stick to the basics. Uh, after several years of trying to find kind of magic ways to, uh, or find ways to get them to focus on risk, um, risk management, helping voters recognize risk, that's a complicated message to get apart, get across. So we're, we're backing that up and saying, you know what, let's go back after life jackets. Life jackets are the common denominator in 80% of our fatalities. Let's really go back to that and spend some time on life jackets. So that's a message that's coming here to law enforcement. I just come back and get that nail on the head. Excellent. Um, voting safety advocate pilot project. So some of you have heard about this, not everyone has. This is a new deal and we're implementing it this year. Historically, law enforcement with our contact, uh, well, you know, Marianne and her volunteers would go into the schools, but law enforcement, those, those 45 full-time officers and a number of seasonals were our first contact to local schools. Uh, and community resources. Uh, in the last decade, we have heard time and time again that that's getting really hard to do. Schools are too busy. Schools don't have time um, to have officers come in and do the, the life jacket and the water safety training that they used to do. So we're doing a pilot project this year. We're actually going to uh, hire three individuals through contracts uh, to go out and work at the civilian level in their local community. Uh, we've already got one person uh, Pretty much on board. Uh, Marianne referenced him earlier. Um, he lives down in Curry County. His name is Luke. Uh, he's a passionate individual who's doing a lot of water safety and has worked with the county sheriff. Um, and he is, he's just, he's passionate, no way to put it, he's passionate and very positive about water safety. And we're going to leverage that. We're going to use him to get him into schools. We're going to provide some money so he can get into schools, talk to kids go to local paddling events, um, anything he can to get in front of voters, especially these uh, novice younger voters uh, who don't 
have experience and help them understand what they don't know. Uh, and that is the model for what we want to do in Lane County and Multnomah County this coming season, too. Um, and in if and we will monitor this, it's actually a very structured process that we'll be working with these individuals in 2022. If we're able to show benefits from this, we will move that up to six individuals statewide as part of the two-year project. Again, these will be contractors. We'll train them. We're looking for civilians, not law enforcement. It will be a bond with local law enforcement on occasion. Um, and mostly, there's somebody, they should be somebody who loves boating, who loves safety, who has some experience delivering instruction on the ground, uh, and can help us uh, sort of be that level of conduit. Um, so I'm really excited about that. It feels like a risk because I don't know if those people are out there, but we're going to do our best to find them and use them. Next slide. We talked about this in the past, so I'll spend a second on it. Um, the Guide Five Star Program, uh, using some, we talked to the Guide Advisory Committee, and they were actually very supportive in November uh, of, of moving ahead with this. Uh, after some discussion and clarifying, they said, well, of course we should be wearing life jackets, but let's sign us up. So this would be a system where a guide would get in, uh, some kind of additional sort of public relations enforcement from the Marine Board if they agree on a high level of ethics standards and etiquette, um, communications and safety equipment above and beyond U.S. Coast Guard requirements, uh, and a line checking use pledge, something like that. But on the details, we're going to be working on that in the coming year. Next page. Uh, Mary Ann sits on the National Education Committee, as you mentioned. They've got a, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, Mary Ann, but the gist of it is they're partnering with the Paddle Sports Committee and um, Head of the Outdoor Industry Association, um, some of the marketing leaders with uh, the, the organization itself, uh, Paddlecraft, Canoes, Kayaks, uh, that sort of thing. Um, there is a joint mission to get safety equipment at the point of sale where people walk into uh, a big box sporting goods store to buy a stand up paddleboard. They know absolutely nothing. If you do it right now, you probably won't get any safety messaging buy that product. Uh, you may not even know that you're required to have a life jacket on board. Uh, you probably don't know anything about state requirements. Uh, we see that a lot. We saw that here in this last year. So there's a national effort and finally some progress on working with retailers to put that information in front of people when they go in to buy this stuff. Uh, and I look forward to the coming year as, as we start to see some of that. We've done some things in the past. We have had some products out there. Uh, but it's not really systematized, and we've actually gone to the Walmarts and Big Fives and uh, those sorts of stores to say, you know what, you're selling these products that people are buying. You, you should be obligated to help us share that safety, that really important safety message with your customers. Okay. Any questions on that? So that's kind of what we're going to do moving forward on the, uh, on the outreach and education piece. Um, the next piece is to talk about some of these regulatory considerations, and then we'll have a discussion, and then we can uh, go and get some rest before tomorrow's meeting. So, any questions on the previous step? Then, all right. Okay, regulatory considerations. Let me find out on my page here. All right. Next slide. So, there's only really a couple of them here. Uh, the first one is our statutory authority. As we're constantly reminded by our AG folks, uh, we are a creature of statute. We cannot see our statutory authority. Um, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've systematically reviewed statute and on occasion found places where maybe we push some things or things are interpreted differently now than they were 10, 20 years ago when we adopted rules. Uh, and we sort of wonder if they are adequately supported in statute. Uh, we think we can do better with our 12 and younger requirements. So if you look at that uh, regulatory document from 1997, I believe, uh, all on after, it makes the statement um, that um, we interpret readily accessible for 12 and younger to mean that that line jacket needs to be worn. So we believe that gave us the authority to implement that rule or that requirement in the rule. We're, we would like to see that altered by having that in statute in the same way 
that the carriage requirement for life jackets is not readily accessible and so forth, and the same way that uh, life jackets in class three Y water are required. So that would be a basic one. Basically, I guess what we're saying is we think it would be a good idea to carry a legislative concept in the 2023 session uh, that would uh, bolster uh, the agency's authority on the 12 and younger requirement. Uh, so we don't get hung out of that. There are other options related to life jacket wear. If the board was interested, and part of what I'm doing here is taking your temperature on this, uh, you can go down this road a long way. We could just clarify our existing rule. 12 and younger is very popular. Uh, there's virtually, I, I can't recall any pushback over the years of anybody saying uh, my 10 year old should not have to wear life jackets. You just never hear that these days. It's well accepted. Uh, so we should make sure that that's on a firm foundation. Are there situations where we would also like to have mandatory wear or consider it or give the board authority to enact it in certain situations? Uh, I think about the last uh, recent legislative session where the authority to allow electric motors on previously motor prohibited lakes was moved from statute to rule. Um, in making that change, we didn't make those waterways open to electric motors. We simply transferred that authority to the Green Board to implement a statewide rulemaking process. And there were serious side words on that. If you'll recall, um, electric motors only have slow and away speeds. So basically, you're trying to maintain the character of that. You know, that could look like all kinds of things. It could look like to when the board determines particular narrowly defined situations where life jacket use would be a significant benefit to public health and safety. The board may probably be able to um, to establish a mandatory wear requirement, something like that. Um, something like that could move the existing class three white water requirement in the rule. So you carry that over, you carry the 12 year old over, you give the, uh, you give the board some additional, whether it's very limited or, or broader authority to enact life jacket requirements. That could be part of a concept. Um, so again, taking your temperature on that. The other option, of course, is to leave it lie and, and go with what we've got um, and just continue to do our best through outreach and education and our existing enforcement operations. Uh, so that's, that is a consideration and I guess kind of a question. The other piece relates to the recreational racing boats, the scholars and the rowers. Um, I believe it's an un unintended, um, I guess, exemption uh, that as recreational users, they can be out there amidst other recreational users and somehow be exempt from having life jacket requirements. Uh, I think you could craft something that would satisfy the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, have some discussions, uh, you know, where if, if you if uh, these racing boats are accompanied to some degree by safety boats with adequate uh, life jackets on board or, or some other sideboards, that they are exempt. Uh, and if operating recreationally outside of the uh, regular schedule or outside of the safety equipment, um, that they could, that they would need to carry or wear additional or life jackets. Uh, I see Laura Jackson's hand up there. I don't know if that's a good idea, a bad idea. I'm not even completely sure it's possible for us to do that because of the federal preemption. Uh, but it is a conversation coming up more and more. So Laura, my, my comment is a very simple one. Don't just pick on the rowers. Racing canoes and kayaks are also exempted. And if you look at a flat water racing shell, even used in a recreational situation, or a flat water racing kayak, there is no place to store one. And in terms of paddle sports, there are some really great PFDs that have been designed that can be worn while you're paddling a flat water style racing boat. If you're rowing, especially like a single skull or a sculling boat, there has not to date been a life jacket that can be safely worn. If you look at people who train in rowing, they wear skin tight clothing because anything you catch your fingers on is putting you in the water. So uh, the wearing in a sculling boat, I have an issue with, um, but also don't just pick on the rowers because paddlers are part of the racing exemption as well. Okay. And that is exactly the kind of feedback I'm looking for. Um, I'm certainly not trying to pick on anybody. Um, but we are trying, you know, when I look at the data specifically, I'm not seeing, and I'll be honest, I'm not seeing fatalities among recreational, you know, scholars or, or racing paddlers. We've had some near misses. 
Uh, we had multiple crew boats um, end up wrapped around bridge piling or sinking in the middle of Foster Lake when the waves come up, and the safety boats are inadequate to respond. Uh, that has uh, some concerns that maybe you can address through some additional regulation or just better partnerships with uh, organizations. But we do see it as, a, as an inconsistency and probably an epic coming from. So I really appreciate your comments, and that's the kind of discussion we want to have before we even begin to entertain the kind of regulatory process. So thank you very much for that. I saw another hand come up. Val, did you have something? Yeah, I would, I would agree with Laura, especially in a racing situation uh, on the skulls and the, and the you know, crew boats, the rowers, and that sort of thing. However, um, not in a racing situation where it's they're just doing it recreationally and they're the only one in the boat by kind of skull. We, we get a few of those kind of people who actually utilize the river here down near the mouth. And, you know, it's, it's not... It's not as comfortable. There, there, there do need to be some new designs for life jackets, and uh, that would be more comfortable for them to wear and not have the safety issue of maybe catching, you know, crab, crab and oar. That's the biggest thing. If you're going to crab and oar, you're going to catch it on your, on your life jacket, you're going to crab and oar. We, we sure. see that even in just the guiding industry. If you're doing whitewater, you know, it's been actually one of the hardest things for most of the class three whitewater guides to get used to is not catching that oar on their life jacket. Okay. And that, those, are, those are great conversations. And this could come down to literally something. If, if we don't feel like there is a clear path forward on a regulatory solution, um, that's where the education uh, piece really comes into play. And, and maybe a little bit of additional scrutiny um, on those chase boats and safety boats. Um, I was particularly alarmed by the incident uh, related to um, an unnamed university team in the South Valley when three of their boats went out with a lot of uh, brand new recruits or people who were just trying to get the taste of, uh, of these team of uh, uh, the eight person skulls. The waves came up and they ended up going underwater and fortunately there were some recreational boats to help get them back to shore. Um, you know, that, that's one example and, and you know how to pass a lot based on one example, but it's something that is a little bit of like um, that could be, maybe, maybe Laura, you would be one person for us to work with just to have the conversations with some of these organizations, help find them a little bit uh, and, and talk about that. But we just wanted to put that out there for, uh, for consideration. Um, I think that is, is that my last slide, Brian? Okay. Uh, summary and questions. So, so that's kind of it. Um, you can weigh things out here. We, we do this all the time. We are we live on a shoestring when it comes to the average education, I and mean, we do have budgets and they're adequate budgets. But we've learned how to partner uh, and leverage our partnerships uh, and apply uh, try to get these free products uh, to help us with this messaging. Um, and we will continue to do that. We'll continue to look for new ways uh, to carry that forward. Uh, Craig, I think I see your hand. Yeah, thanks, Randy. I think this has been an excellent presentation. I really appreciate it. You did seem to indicate to the presentation that additional regulation does improve uh, wearing of PFDs for all seatbelts. So you wanted to uh, check my temperature on it. I very much supported that it were appropriate. And we could do as many other regulations as we can to uh, ensure people are wearing. You know, like this, but it's not only protects them, it protects the people who have to go out there and try to rescue them. So uh, I think that everybody should to do what they can to be safe on board. And the I think are essential to uh, do that. So thanks, Randy. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, one thing I did uh, occasionally when I get all excited about a presentation like this, I, I, I Think about it a lot. I, I worked well in the uh, late evening last night on it, and I was back up at four o'clock this morning looking at numbers, trying to figure out, you know, who's the next person who's, this is a really morbid way to put it, who's the next person who's going to die in a voting accident, or who's, who's most likely? So I tried to look at the last five years of our Oregon specific voting data. Mary Ann did a, a great job with this last year, but I want to see, you know, what's it look like in the last five years? When you look at just one year, 
the sample size is small, so there can be a whole lot of variability from year to year. And you'll see that in our data, it jumps up and down from year to year. Last five years smoothed that out a little bit. So I thought, okay, who's your average voter? And I kind of boiled it down, looking at the belt curves, looking at this. The average voter we would want to talk to with the life jacket message is, um, is a male, age 19 to 79, over operating an open power boat or a canoe or a kayak, operating from May to August in a lake or a river. That's where the bulk of the people are, are dying right now because of uh, in boating accidents. When I first started this process, I was thinking, wow, you know, if I was in charge, uh, I would like to require life jackets to be worn when you cross the bar, uh, when you're, you know, in the white water situations. And then you go through the data and you realize that those, by the, by the participation numbers, that's not where the fatalities lie. That may be where the biggest risk is, but that's not where the fatalities lie. It's, it's on the flat water, uh, lakes and rivers, uh, and it's in the most common boats because that's where the numbers are. So I think we, I, I would challenge my staff to do some additional looking at who our audience is so we can focus and craft messages that appeal to age groups, uh, that, we can, that we can consider regulations um, that are either selective enough or broad enough uh, to bring about some benefits and some changes. And I'm not certainly, I'm certainly not here proposing what that looks like. You had the petition last spring to require life jacket use. I think, it, I hope my memory is correct, or correct me if I'm not, was for paddle craft in the cold weather season. Um, so basically, fall, winter, spring. Um, that is something that New York and some of the other, uh, uh, well, that New York has done. If you look at exposure hours and risk, that may be an appropriate solution to get at some of those shoulder season fatalities. Um, but when I look at the number of fatalities by month, uh, that is a small percentage of the annual um, deaths that we see. The vast majority of our deaths occur in May, June, July, and August. I mean, that's 80% of them right there. So uh, maybe one thing the board could do uh, that would be useful is to uh, send staff back uh, and look at options, something like that, or just to, just to feed an idea to you. Um, there was one other thing. Oh, when I was digging through these numbers, I also looked, and I thought this was very useful. I'm going to try to do a little bit more uh, to make sure this is a valid number. But when you look at the last, uh, from 2015 through 2020, uh, we had 113 voting fatalities, okay? If you separate out the non-motorized, basically the non-registered vote fatalities, so we're only looking at people who have been through mandatory education, okay? If we just look at those 55 motor boat fatalities, 43% of those victims did not have a voter education card. So 57% did. When I first looked at that, I thought, well, that's not very good. That's only like 50-50. But when you look at the compliance rate, law enforcement tells us, the law enforcement data tells us that 90% of the power voters out there have voter education cards. So if voter education cards didn't matter, were statistically insignificant, you would assume then that 90% of the voting fatalities victims have voter education cards, and they don't. It's less than half that. So that tells me that you're uh, that you're half as likely to be involved in a voting fatality in Oregon if you have a voter education card. Whether that's a causation from the education, I'm not sure, but I would like to think it is, and I think it speaks well to the education requirement that we have in the state. That is a step in the right direction. So that may be part of this discussion uh, as well. Uh, I believe that there is a bill uh, in Washington that would look at extending their voter education uh, to the non-motorized uh, side of the world too. I'm not saying that's right, but there are benefits from education, required education. That is the end of my presentation. I would be glad to answer any additional questions or bring back any data that you would like to see uh, and revisit things as you would care to see them revisited. Uh, but just one last statement here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate my whole staff appreciates you taking the time uh, to listen to us and kind of see the world through our eyes as we as we work through this. Thank you.
So, Randy, I have a question. This this goes back to almost the beginning there. We we're talking about the penalties in 830.990, the penalties for, um, for not having a PFD. Okay. Is that a fixable ticket? So if somebody um, gets, can they can they use that money? You know, so, so the the fine now is one hundred ten dollars. You said right. So then yeah, I, I I go to Eddie's presentation of is your life worth one hundred dollars? Can they use that and fix the ticket? Um, they, it depends on the county. As a state agency, I don't have authority uh, to determine what the local courts do, but many not law enforcement. Agencies uh, will work with their local courts to provide a essentially a fix it ticket process. Uh, so if you come in after your ticket and show the judge your life jacket, uh, you can get that uh, ticket um, torn up. To re remind you guys, uh, report a little bit. Uh, the last session we reduced that cost of the adult life jacket citation from uh, class D to class. Well, from 265 to 110. And that was because law enforcement had been telling us for years that when they come up on a boat with three adults in it and no life jackets, there's just no way in heck they're going to issue $1,000 worth of life citations or $900, whatever it is. Um, but they would do $310 citations. So they really asked for that. We watched those numbers this summer to see if suddenly they were going to start enforcing more life jackets. Uh, violations, and then we had COVID, and the whole world is different, and it's just an anomaly of the year. Um, so I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but I'm holding off law enforcement to it because that is the result of their wish. Did that answer your question a little bit? Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I was wondering if it was um, by county by county or court by court. So It, it is by county. Mm -hmm. Craig, did you have a question? Yeah, I would like to regulations, additional regulations that we consider, recognizing that we have to stay away from the Coast Guard guidelines and of course have to stay with the statute. So I think we just talked about the running skulls and the such, but what other regulations would be considered a quick place? Okay. Uh, one thing we could do for that, instead of giving you an answer right now, um, is look at some of the things other states have done where they've seen some benefits just to begin the conversation. And then uh, look at some of our more specific geographic um, and temporal um, fatality sort of situations and see if there are things that we could uh, apply there more surgically. Uh, you know, one easy thing to do would be to simply require anybody who's in a power boat 21 feet and under to wear a life jacket when they're on the boat underway. That would be an easy one to do. Um, doesn't mean it would be popular, doesn't mean the legislature would support it. Um, a more politically feasible thing might be something more surgical that says in cold weather years, wear a life jacket, or cold weather months, wear a life jacket in certain situations. When you're crossing a bar, wear a life jacket. When you're um, doing certain other things, wear a life jacket. Is that something you'd like to see as kind of a universe of possibilities? Yeah, that's what I think. Okay, we can do that. Uh, Laura? I'm kind of intrigued by the cold, water, the cold water stuff as well, and not just for non-motorized, but across all motors. Yeah. And when that petition came out, I went and dug around a little bit, and I think there's like six or seven states that have similar regulations, but like half of those states, it's not statewide. It's only on very specific water bodies. And I don't know if we have the data about fatalities of all sorts across all types of boating related to estimated water temperature, but um, those kinds of things to me, I mean, I think it is really important to, because that whole cold water reflex thing is, I think, probably part of the issue and to keep people's faces and heads out of the water might help solve the problem a little bit. Okay. I really appreciate that, um, and I think you're right. When I look at the data and I see that we're almost exactly 50-50 split over five years between motorized and non-motorized fatalities, the most frequent, you really can't say, oh, this is a, a non-motorized problem or oh, this is a motorized problem. It's really a motor problem um, in certain situations. Um, 
So I, I appreciate those comments, and we can do some research on that, and I'm pretty sure that with a little bit of effort, we can look at the last five years of data and tell you what water temperatures were uh, at a given time. And, you know, Oregon, it, it can be interesting. We can have cold water well into June, depending on what the runoff is like. Uh, so that can, that can affect things, too. Um, yeah. And that's um, some of the health sports organizations for a long time do like air plus water temperature for guidance yeah. on dry suit, wet suit, kind of use. So, um, I mean, even like a ballpark of temperatures would be really helpful. Okay. All right. We can do that. All right. Eddie has his hand up. Go ahead, Eddie. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to piggyback on your comment in regards to fixing tickets, um, I just want to give you uh, a quick update on that. It's funny you bring that up. Law enforcement has noticed a trend where if they do have a fix it ticket option, uh, when that individual who got the citation goes before the judge, they notice a lot of times the price tags are still in the life jacket, in which after getting the ticket dropped, they will then go and return the life jacket. So I, I noticed a trend primarily um, uh, in the Valley area where the fix-it ticket uh, doesn't necessarily prove to be the safest option because of that reason. So in turn, law enforcement, I think, have just been giving a citation um, without that fix-it ticket option. So I just wanted to give you a little bit more information on that situation. So I appreciate that, Eddie. That's a, I, I guess I would never consider doing that. So it never entered my mind, but thank you. Yeah, Clackamas County for a while did a diversion program for life jackets. I don't know if they still do it, but if you got a life jacket violation, you could get away if you went and sat through a three hour training course. Uh, and I sat through it once and it was a little bit painful. Uh, you would get away, and that was one way to do it, with a creative solution. And it probably worked. I see another hand up. Uh, Eddie, or Yep. Okay. Pulling. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'll drop it. Thank you, Eddie. You're welcome. Right, I can't ask it. If any of the things here at Blackwood County and their conversion program, whether the program is useful to work or not, I believe there are similar things that are done or car accident that the court might reduce one's punishment course. It seems like education is also a component from all of this, like Laura was saying, require um, information is also something I hear a lot of in the voting community and certainly there's a housing will be just fine, and then people don't realize that our waters are not sustainable. They are all all sorts of hazards. And then I also really appreciate the continued partnership with media. I feel like that is an opportunity for additional education. It seems like, unfortunately, situations like this don't, don't register with people until it becomes personal, or until they can see some, some connection. With the victim or the person who's injured. So, I want to thank your team for doing that and encourage you to continue to work with media. All right. Thank you. Um, appreciate that very much. Is there any direction? Oh, Laura. Um, I wanted to throw this out. I think it's more in uh, Mary Ann's with her national group. Is again, don't just focus on this, the businesses that qualifies like the outdoor sports industries, the REI is the next adventures places like that. But um, I mean you walk into Dick's Sporting Goods and they're selling pedal sports equipment, but the only life jackets that they're selling are appropriate for motorized boating or water skiing. And really hitting the buyers of the generic sporting goods stores to include more paddler friendly, sub friendly, and you know, the education that, tell, that those people get the understanding that they are boaters. Because when I talk to people on the river who bought their equipment at more of the big box place, they, again, that information that you are a boater, you need to have a life jacket, is completely lost on. And I don't know if that's through stuff in the, you know, public service announcements or 
Um, I sent director Ward a video that was done in Seattle about 30 years ago with an unknown, unknown actor named Bill Nye, who was doing this silly thing about cold water immersion and the 50-50-50-50 rule. Um, you know, stuff like that just on TV, it, it wakes people up. Yeah, I think you're right, and, and you're exactly right. The big box stores are the target of some of these efforts to get point of sale information. Last time we went into Dick's, had a reasonably good display that talked about your life jackets and things that were required. Um, but it didn't match the effectiveness as a product that they really wanted you to buy. You know, and that's what we need to do is we really need to give them a reason to buy a safety message. Uh, and we really need industry to partner with us on that. So I, I appreciate those comments, and I will uh, continue to work with Marianne as, as we look at that. Um, one last question, and then I'll shut up, and that is uh, related to uh, the authority. Do you want some maybe additional direction in the coming? We're not in a rush because we're long ways out from 2023, but related to the uh, statutory authority to require where is that something you would like some additional Information on what that might look like. Um, I'm going to ask that you would work to have that information. You know? Okay. We'll, we'll put it together. Um, yeah, we can do that. We can put it together. Maybe provide some additional talking points when we present future information. Okay. Um, Larry, is there anything you want to finish up with or summarize as we come to a close here? Uh, before, uh, yeah, we'll see what Chair Early's at. Is just, um, again, want to echo the comments from the board of such good information for staff. It's a lot of information. So, board members, if you have questions that you think of tonight and you wish you would have asked them, you know, don't hold back. Email Randy. We'd be happy to give you his email. No. <laughs> email Randy, Mary, and myself. Don't, don't, uh, don't sit out there wondering, we would love to get that information for you. And, um, you know, a friend of mine that does some um, safety coaching type things, one time summarized it best, I thought, which is, if people wear their life jacket, voted sober and paid attention, you know, Marianne and, and Randy might be out of jobs eventually. So it seems like simple, seems like a simple thing to say, but it, it is um, a contributing factor to so much of what happens out there is staying sober, wearing a life jacket, Paying attention. So, um, uh, Chair Early, I just wanted to let you know we are getting for our area quite a bit of snow. It started a couple hours ago. Um, we shouldn't have a problem getting started in the morning. Um, but if something was to change on that, I'll certainly communicate with you overnight and let you know if we need an adjustment on the time. But I just wanted to make sure you know that um, we are getting quite a bit of snow. But I think right now. Um, we, we shouldn't have a problem with the staff side making the start time tomorrow. Okay, that sounds good. You know, we've got some pretty high winds already starting out here, too. So I watched some of my trees halfway bend over just a few minutes ago. So um, I, I would like to thank um, Brian, Eddie, Marianne. I know Ginger and Jessica weren't there, and Randy. Uh, you guys always do an incredible job of bringing us such, such incredible information from statistics to um, just anecdotal things and including the videos, it's very, very much appreciated. And it's a testament to your division, Randy, and how well your staff pulls together to do one of these presentations. And you might think it's not seamless, but, it's, you, but it isn't, it's seamless to us, okay? All of it flows together so well. And uh, I know that um, you've got your technology gurus there in, in Jessica and Brian, but I know that everybody else there works on it real hard too. And I know that we'll say something tomorrow about Sandy and her contributions to all of this, but uh, I wish I had been there to be able to do the drive-by for her. So we will uh, address her tomorrow. Okay. If anybody has any um, issues because of the weather tomorrow or has any difficulties, um, you can send me a text. Send me an email, um, contact um, just, you know, um, anybody at the, at the office there, too, and just, just let us know that you're having some difficulties. We've got a pretty packed agenda tomorrow and some important items on that agenda, so 
uh, we want to make sure that that we're gonna we're gonna be okay to be able to conduct our meetings. So, does anybody have any final comments or um, questions for Randy or any of his department? Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. I learned a lot. Okay. Well, again, thank you, Randy, to you and your your. Uh, department for, for this great presentation, and we will adjourn until tomorrow morning at 8.30, and uh, thanks, Larry. Thank you, and just a reminder, it'll take us just a second here to turn off the live stream, so we'll be live even though it's